Hey everybody, Matt Bell at the Electric Violin Shop. We are continuing our Effects on Violin series. And this week we're gonna talk about something that I think is gonna be helpful for most of you who play out in pretty loud environments. You've been playing out with a band before and a, we're gonna to listen to you play for a minute, right? The band's going, you're kind of laying back a little bit, but then you hear somebody say, I can't hear the fiddle. Okay, I'll dig in. We've all been there, right? People are like, oh, I can't hear you when you're laying back, only when you're really laying into that fiddle. And you're like, man, I can't lay into this thing all night. Well, the answer to that problem might be compression, okay? And it's a thing that pretty much everybody is gonna have put on their channel by the front of house person, whether they put it there or not. So it's maybe best that we all understand what compression is and how we can use it in our rig or at least be able to communicate with the engineer as they're using it out front. So this effects on violin series, we're gonna hit a different effect every week. And these are the effects that we've hit so far. If you've missed those discussions, I urge you to go back and check them out on YouTube and get caught up with where we are because we are gonna talk about some of these concepts in the following weeks. What exactly is compression? Well, it is what it says it is. It is compressing or shrinking the dynamic range of the signal that you're sending to the board. String instruments have a huge dynamic range from pianissimo to fortissimo, is, it's a big difference for strings. And in many contexts, our quiets are too quiet and our louds are too loud. So if you've played in a band before with a drummer, you may have experienced this thing. Unless you're taking a solo, I can't hear you. So during sound check, the engineer is gonna say, play as loud as you can, and they're gonna set your level so where you're not gonna clip out your channel at your very, very loudest. And you're thinking, I got something for you, Mr. Sound Engineer, man. I'm going to sandbag you. When you say play your loudest, I'm going to go about 70%. And that way, when I go to take a solo, everybody's going to be able to hear me. Well, if you do that, yes, the sound engineer is going to turn you up during sound check because you're holding back. And they're going, okay, well, that's as loud as they get. I'm going to turn up their channel. And then for the first two or three songs, everybody can hear you just fine when you're comping. Hey, this is great. Now you go to take a solo, you kick your boost button, or you play a little harder, you're gonna clip out that channel, it's gonna sound awful, and the engineer is gonna turn your channel down, but not a little bit, they're gonna turn it down a lot. Sound engineers do not like to be surprised like that. And now you're worse off than you were before, now they can't hear you at all, even when you are soloing, and it's your fault. So, what if we had something where we could set a threshold volume, and below that volume, we don't do anything. But above that volume, we kind of squeeze down the dynamic range to make our, our louds a little quieter so that their quiets are louder in comparison. Well, that is exactly what a compressor does. So I got these graphs from midnightmagicsounds.com. It's a fantastic website, a really great resource. This graph here will show that we're gonna pick a threshold, say minus 12 dB, and then above that, we're gonna compress stuff. Below that, we're gonna leave it alone. And this is when we say we're gonna compress it, well, by how much? Well, we will talk about a ratio of a two to one or five to one or 10 to one ratio. Well, one to one is no compression at all. And then a two to one ratio, if I exceed that threshold by eight dB, two to one is gonna cut that in half. So it means I will only, the, what comes out of the compressor is gonna be four dB above the threshold, even though what went in was 8 dB above. Does that make sense? This is what a signal would look like without compression. So that's that signal. Your louds are pretty loud. Your quiets are pretty quiet. And then this is with compression. It's, it's the same dynamics, just a little less drastic. And that's kind of what we really want in order to sit in that mix a little bit better so that the engineer doesn't have to chase your fader. Like when you're taking a solo, okay, we're here but then they're comping, oh, we've got to push them up because they're not loud enough. And they're not going to chase that fader all night. They're going to get tired or they're going to forget. And when you're just comping, it's going to get lost in the mix. Or your solo is going to be way too loud and then you're going to be hung out there and that's no good either. So compression pulls it in so that when you're comping, it's loud enough to be heard. But then your solo would just kind of sit on top of that mix a little bit. And that's what we want. 
The other thing it can do is it can smooth out your playing a little bit. If we've got some right hand, maybe we're hitting some of these notes a little harder than others, it's going to smooth that out a little bit and make those transients less strong than they were before. And here is an example of that. I'm going to play a thing for you with no compression. Right? So we've, we've all heard that sort of thing. We're hitting those, those uh, accents a little hard. But what's happening in a mix is that accent's going to pop through, but then those little turns between the accents are going to get lost. So we can turn on a compressor. We can set our threshold. Maybe we'll go, we'll set the threshold, you know, maybe down here. Set our ratio maybe at three to one. And now let's see, we're going to watch the gain reduction here. This is how much it's pulling down the peak. So that's, it's smoothing that signal out a little bit. We can actually look at a graph in real time. So the, the black line here, the gray line, is how much is coming in, and the white line is how much gain reduction we have. One more time. So you can see that it's smoothing that sound out quite a bit. And that's going to help us. Now, what happens with that is that sometimes it can be a little frustrating if it's in your monitor because you feel like you're playing with dynamics, but those dynamics are not coming through as much as you think they are. So this is all going to be a bit of a trade-off. If there is compression in your pedal board and it's coming back to your monitor, it is going to feel like your violin is a little less responsive than you're wanting it to be. Um, which is why I don't usually use a lot of compression in my monitor. I kind of leave that for out front, but we'll talk about that in a minute. So you may have noticed there were a bunch of knobs on that compressor. Uh, that's a plug-in in Logic. And we talked about threshold and ratio, but we didn't talk about any of the other ones. So let's do that so you know what they all are. I said that we get gain reduction when we go above the threshold. It reduces our volume by some amount, which is determined by the ratio right? So it's making our signal quieter. How is that going to make me better heard? That's what makeup is for. So if I'm taking 10 dB off of my loudest peaks, then I'm going to come back to this makeup knob and I'm going to turn it up 10 dB. So when it, my volume is reduced by the compressor, then the makeup is going to shift the whole thing up by whatever I tell it. So if I'm knocking 10 dB off of my loudest peaks, I'll come to the makeup, I'll turn it up 10 dB, and then it places me higher in the mix, and that's good. And then we're going to look at the knee here and attack and release. So for the knee, that tells us what the behavior of the compressor is as I approach the threshold. A hard knee doesn't do anything until you get to the threshold, and then it kicks in that full amount of compression right then. A soft knee starts sort of feathering in that compression as I approach as I approach the threshold. And then once I get past the threshold, then it's at full force. I tend to use kind of a soft or a medium knee so that you don't hear the compressor kick in. I kind of want it to be fairly transparent. Uh, but these are all artistic decisions that you get to make and you can do however you want. The attack time is how long does it take the compressor to start compressing? When I bust through that threshold, does it instantly grab onto my signal or does it give me a few milliseconds before it grabs on? And it, it kind of depends on why you're using the compressor. If you're using it to pull out some of those transients, then you want it to have a very, very fast attack. If you're trying to use it basically just to smooth out levels between my solo volume and my comping volume, I might want a little slower attack so that when I do give it a little transient, the front edge of that transient is still going to pop through and it's going to give me that accent that I was trying to play with. And that can help it be a little less frustrating uh, if it's in your in-ears. Release time is exactly the opposite of that. It's how long after I get down below the threshold does it let go of that gain reduction. And again, you can figure out what that's going to do. Another thing that compression does is it causes sustain. 
And so if I think about the fact that a compressor is lowering volume above the threshold but not below, when I let go of a note, say I'm going to let that note ring out because I'm taking the bow off the string, it's going to give me much more sustain than I had before. Because think about this first graph here, when I take the bow off the string, it's going to decrease fairly quickly, right? That's what the, my sound will do unless it's compressed. And then it's that compressor is going to hold it until it lets go. And so when I pull the bow off the string, it'll go la, and then it'll fall off. So we have to just know that that's one of the things that happens when you use a compressor is you are going to have more sustain. And it means if if you bump a note or something, that note is going to ring out longer than it would have before. So pros and cons of compression. It can help you stay in a mix. That's a good thing. It can smooth out your bow hand. If we've got some, if you know, we're, we're a little more uh, accenty than we wish we were, that can smooth it out. The con is that it can squash the life out of your tone. If there are no dynamics in your playing at all, if I compress too much and there are no dynamics in my playing at all, everything is going to sound like this. And it's going to sound really mechanical and really lifeless. Uh, one of the pros of compression is that it can bring up your lower frequencies and bring down your higher frequencies. It's a thing that violinists actually tend to like a lot. It thickens up your tone a little bit and it takes some of that harshness out of there. But on the flip side, it can make it sound a little dull. So it's one of the things we listen for if we're listening to hear if something has been over compressed. Does it sound like there's no dynamics at all? And does it sound like, like somebody just sanded it off too much? There's, there's not any sparkle to that sound at all. Now, another con of using compression is it doesn't cause feedback, but it can make feedback worse. Think about if I've got one frequency that's kind of popping out that is causing me to have a, a feedback issue. What compression does is it brings up all those other frequencies in relation and if I start feeding back, I could start feeding back in multiple frequencies at once. So if you are using a fair amount of compression on your signal and you're starting to get some feedback issues, one of the tools at your disposal is to ease back on that compression and that could help you. So everything's a balancing act and we just have to find the sweet spot, right? Now, how and when do we use compression? Personally, I'm not a big compression guy. I don't use a lot of compression in my board. I leave it for front of house. They're the ones that have to fit my signal into the mix. I just have to be aware that if I have a lot of distance between my pianissimo and my fortissimo, I'm probably going to get compressed a lot. And it's going to take a lot of the dynamic uh, expression that I like to use. It's going to take a lot of that out of my hands. So if I will be judicious in keeping my quiets a little louder and keeping my louds a little quieter, if I'll sort of do that myself, then the front of house person is not going to feel obligated to do that for me. And then I still have control over where I sit. Now I do use it on effects that can be a little peaky like wah or auto wah. And I'm going to give you a little demonstration of that right now. Let me move. You are not going to see what I'm doing here, but I promise you I'm doing some really cool stuff. Um, all right. So we will shut this compressor off and we will listen to a wah pedal. What happens with a wah pedal when the heel is down, they're pretty quiet. And when the toe is down, they're pretty loud. Heel down. Toe down. So what that what happens is everybody can hear what happens when my toe's down, but when my heel's down, you kind of lose it. So we can put a compressor on and it's going to smooth that out. Let's look at this meter. So what that does is it allows those kind of ghost notes. It allows those ghost notes to come through because it's pulling down when I've got my toe down and I'm doing those kind of peaky things right there. So I will use a compressor in the Helix. I can set it up to where I kick my wah on. It also kicks on a compressor at the same time. And that is, in fact, how I've got my Helix set up. If you buy my presets from me, um, I've got a set of Helix presets. If you buy those from me, that is all in there. When you kick on the wah pedal, it also kicks on a compressor. So that is one of the cool things about some of these more advanced um, 
uh, multi effects pedals that they can allow you to control multiple things with one switch. Now, if you want to use just a stomp box, you're like, well, I'd like to use a compressor, but I've got, you know, stomp boxes in my, my rig. How do I do that? Yeah. So they make compressor pedals for guitars. They're typically called sustain pedals for the reasons that we talked about before. When a guitar player hits that string and lets it ring out, a compressor is actually going to make that guitar sustain longer. So because they're using a compressor a little bit differently than we do, the, the knobs on their sustain pedals are going to be labeled kind of in a weird way. They're not going to say threshold and ratio and knee and attack. They're not going to say all that. You're going to have to kind of read into, you're going to have to read the manual and kind of read into what each one of those knobs does so you can figure out how to make this thing act right for a violinist. Uh, where do I put it in my signal chain? I like to put it after anything that can affect the bass level, like a wah pedal or an auto wah pedal. Uh, I want to put it before anything that I'm worried about peeking out. And I want to put it before my solo boost. Because if I've got a compressor after my solo boost, then my boost isn't going to boost, right? Kind of defeats the whole purpose. Um, be aware of your volume dependent effects like distortion or auto wah. Distortion, the louder you play, the more it's going to distort. And in auto wah, the louder you play, the more toe down that virtual wah pedal is. So if you've got a compressor before your distortion, you've got a compressor before your auto wah, you're not going to have as much control over the volume dependent nature of those effects. And again, make sure you put it before your solo boost. So there are two other effects that are sort of like compression that I want you to be aware of. One is called a limiter. It is a form of compressor. It sets a very top maximum volume that cannot be exceeded. And it's by using a, a compressor with an infinite ratio. So once we get to the threshold, it will not let it get any louder above that. And we use those on our in-ears and we'll usually use them on the front of house basically as a last uh, line of defense against like a catastrophic event that would blow out your speakers. Imagine in your in-ears that you've got your vocal mic pumped in there and you've got it set up pretty loud because you don't sing that loud. And you want got to be able to hear yourself in your ears. And then some drunk person runs up on stage and goes, woo, because that's what drunk people do. You could literally cause hearing damage to yourself if there's not a limiter on your in-ears. So always, 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 always put a limiter on your in-ears. Or say somebody knocks your mic stand over and it hits the ground with a big bump. You don't want that bump to blow your ears out if you have a limiter on there it will protect not only the drivers in your ears, it will protect your literal human anatomical ears. So always use them with in-ear monitors. And then an expander is the opposite of that. An expander is the opposite of, of a compressor. Imagine you've got a mic on your instrument and when you're playing, it's fine. But when you're not playing, boy, it sure is picking a lot of stuff up on the stage and it's just coming through and you don't have good isolation on that channel. If you put an expander on that, you set the threshold right about the quietest that you're going to play. And then you set a ratio of two or three to one. So everything you play above that, it's actually going to boost you up above that background noise. And it's, uh, it's going to make your, uh, you're going to make your mic a little more isolated. Okay. So it's a little bit like a gate that when you're not playing, there won't be as much signal coming out to front of house, but when you are playing, there'll be more signal coming out. Does that make sense? So, I hope that has been helpful. I hope you understand compression a little bit better than you did before. Hope that you've got an idea of, hey, how can I use this to benefit my sound in the mix? And, uh, and maybe I can understand what that engineer is doing out front when I'm playing now, and we can be a better team to have good sound for me and for the audience. And uh, yeah, it's a wonderful thing. So as always, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel, check out these other videos, and we'll catch you guys next time.